And I'm going to hand you over to Karen. And Karen, if you could share your slides, you should be a wee co-host there now. Sure, let's see yeah. if I can sort that out. Thank you, and I'm with myself. So talk, talk to us in the chat, send us your questions as we go. Any thoughts, comments, things you want to discuss. And Karen, I'll be giving you a wave and even maybe button in if you go way over your time. Sorry, I hate doing that, but we can. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay. No problem at all. Let's see if I can share my screen. And um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's lovely that there are so many people here, um, particularly for... Uh, my presentation, and so I share this screen um, because introducing a network, well, what's that about? It's about getting as many people as you can to uh, join. So that's absolutely fab to have uh, so many people here. I'm not sure if I actually can share my screen, but um, I'll sort it out in time, hopefully. You have to make your host, Karen, do you? Um, I think I am already, so let's see. Uh, Maybe you host, host. I think I'm sure it wouldn't be an online webinar without um, some technical issues. <sighs> oh, so, so you should be able to sh hit share screen in the middle. Got it, got it. Let's see now. Doreen, you're going to have to hand host back to me now. I might have made it more complicated. No, no, it's fine. It'll it'll come up in a minute, I hope. But in the meantime, I mean, basically, I uh, can just talk to you. And if I can share the screen, I can share it. And if I can't, not to worry. Um, so, uh, yes, I am here to introduce you to the idea of this uh, research and impact network. So I'm Karen Galway. I'm a lecturer in mental health. Um, I teach undergrad nurses in the School of Nursing and Midwifery, and I am a researcher at the Centre for Evidence and Social Innovation at Queen's. Um, so I'm really excited. Like I said, there's so many people here and it's a great time to introduce uh, the Suicide Prevention Research and Impact Network. With or without slides, we'll roll with the punches. Um, so it's a really actually important time and a good time um, to launch this initiative with our new mental health champion in place. And um, there, is a, there is a new Protect Life strategy for suicide prevention in Northern Ireland and a mental health strategy out for uh, consultation. So it is a really important time and a good time and there's a really good appetite for change and improvement and investment in our mental health and, and suicide prevention efforts here in Northern Ireland. So the network's been set up really just to bring people together who are interested in and in working in suicide prevention and self-harm research. Um, and you know, with three main aims at the research network, that is connection, support, and advocacy. So for connections, we, we want to bring people together, academics, professionals, clinicians, policymakers, community-led organizations, along with people with lived experience. And that's really to enhance our existing research efforts. And we have quite a bit of capacity in this area in Northern Ireland already. We've got a lot of researchers working in this area and the broader area of mental health and well-being. So the network we're hoping will act as a hub to bring people together and um, to build that capacity and to uh, really to make an impact on policy and, and evidence-based practice. <clears throat> In terms of support then, you know, we want to support researchers to attract funding and to reach those with the right skills and the right experience and bring, bring the people together to make teams, to ensure that what research we do is relevant, it's connected, it's Im implementable, and um, to, make a, to make change, to, to develop things. And you know, that will also help us importantly to support early career researchers who are working in this area. It's not an easy area to research in, it's not an easy area to work in, um, but it, uh, it, uh, is, there's a lot of camaraderie and we have a lovely team working together on developing the network. We have a research development network group. Um, it's small, we're just starting and we're open to new members. Um, and our third aim is really that concept of advocacy. So we want to advocate for as much as possible for 
robust evaluation of work that's underway and quality improvement and to, to help others to build, build those skills um, across different organisations as well. So how do you join? Well, you join with a link on the slides. So that's not ideal if I can't send you the slides. Um, let's see if I can share them now. But um, we, we are working on a website. We have a link for um, joining up to the, to the network. And we'll put that link in the chat for you. I can't get the slides up. Um, and that is, it's, it, we're, we're not expecting to um, send out an awful lot of information. What we want to do is to be able to just point to funding opportunities and to link people together. And so we just feel that's really important at the minute um, to, to get us through this difficult period. We'll be able to link better and so we're getting so used to doing that online. Um, so that's really so that's really helpful, and that's all that's all I wanted to tell you. If I can get the the, the slides up, but we'll get them up, um, and I, or maybe I can send them to Rhonda and she'll get them up. I can certainly do that, Karen. I've also put Hi. the link in for anyone that wants to join, and Aiden perfect. Put the Twitter link in as well. So perfect. That's brilliant. Yeah. No, that's been fantastic, Karen. I think one of the most important things to say is that um, the Protect Life strategy now has an advisory group around research and um, academic evidence. Uh, and so the Suicide Prevention Research Network really feeds into the Protect Life strategy that way. So it's really about trying to connect academics on the ground in Northern Ireland particularly, but elsewhere too, to the policy initiatives that are happening so that research is really embedded there into, into policy um, into policy changes. One of my goals as mental health champion is to make sure that we use our academic researchers really well and that that the research evidence is produced you know translates into policy and practice and changes on the ground because i don't think we've been very good at doing that to date in northern ireland so um so so that's great one of the, the things i'd like you to consider everybody is to respond to the mental health strategy consultation i'll put a wee link up in the chat as well but um, at the minute my concern is that the mental health strategy doesn't have too much about suicide prevention in there it's kind of suicide prevention's left to the protect life Two strategy but i think actually suicide prevention should be woven through the mental health strategy um now there, there is the zero suicide initiative that's happening and that is around suicide prevention for people who are in contact with mental health services um, and that's a great program of work um, it's about training it's, it's about using all of those quality improvement initiatives a lot of them are actually from University of Manchester script so um, Sharon's colleagues um, those qual the 10 quality improvement um, I think it's 10 that that are known that are evidence to the to reduction in suicide and people who are in, in the care of mental health services. So that's already happening. But I think there's a lot more we could be doing in terms of early intervention and prevention. And we could be putting that into the mental health strategy. So I'm going to put that we link also in into the chat so brilliant stuff so contact us get involved with this it, it would just be lovely to have a group of researchers who are interested in this who meet regularly who share ideas who work together um so that we can really really improve suicide prevention practices in northern ireland and, and and change how things are delivered here on the ground so everybody gets the the benefit of the research and the most up-to-date treatments and interventions so so that's great so um if there's any, if you do find your slides, sure, Karen, we can come on again at the Q&A and you can point to particular things. Sure. I've sent them to Rhonda now, so uh, she'll be able to pop them up um, when we get an opportunity. But I, mean, I have them, yeah. Slides anyway, so we're Good not stuff. Will we, will share we go to, Will we go to Claire next and then we'll go back? Um, sure in the Q&A if, that, if that's all right. Does that sound good? Um, we we can then reintroduce it in, in the Q&A when we talk about how we can work together. So our next speaker, our next speaker is Claire, Claire Curran from Families Voices Forum. And 
this this group have been so so important in directing and shaping the protect life strategies and and in helping us understand what the factors are that influence suicide and what needs to be done um and claire's got a very unique perspective and works with families bereaved families here in northern ireland so so actually they know exactly what's going on so i'm going to hand you over now to to claire um and hopefully claire have you got slides there or anything or what i do have slides and i'm hoping it's all going to go to plan See, it could be a problem with the whole yeah. link who knows like, don't be <laughs> telling me that Let, let's have a go so if you do try and share your slides there Or maybe you would. Oh, oh, we've got. Are we up? Yeah, that's you. That'd be excellent. One wait a second. I can see this. You've already full screen there, then we can. Mm. What is it? Yeah. Better? Fantastic. Perfect. Thank excellent. You. So. Thank you very much for asking us to speak today. Um, as Siobhan said, my name's Claire Curran. I'm the chairperson for the Family Voices Forum. I have been for the last four years. I've been involved with the Family Voices Forum for the last 16 years, long time. Um, so I would also echo Siobhan's comments as well about um, the consultation on the mental health strategy and getting everybody to, to put forward their points. This is our mental health strategy for the next 10 years. It's really, really important that we feed into it to make a service that is fit for purpose and that meets the needs of our population. So, and here we go. So, Family Voices Forum. We are a large group of diverse individuals who have been directly affected by the suicide of a loved one, family, friends. We've been working together since 2006. Our membership is flexible and fluid and it's responsive to the needs of the people who are involved. We have individuals who are involved from across the country and um, some very rural places as well. So we meet across the country, but we have a regular governance meeting in Belfast. We give people the opportunity to be able to contact us by email, telephone, video conference, and lots of sort of formal and informal meeting arrangements, because not everybody's the same. And it's not as easy for some people to come along to a meeting that we have or an event that we have. Our membership is across all five trust areas and our membership is on a volunteer basis. Um, and it's people who want to make a difference. It's people who want to have their voices heard and they want to make change to make sure that what we have in place works for everyone. Um, what we do, so we ensure that the voice of people who have lived experience is listened to and acted upon with collaborative working approaches. So we work alongside public health agency and trusts and the Department for Health and our researchers like Siobhan and Karen. Um, we attend strategic level meetings across the country. So we attend all the Protect Life Implementation Working Groups um, and the Regional Protect Life um, Steering Group, the All Party Working Group on Suicide Prevention and also the um, Regional SD1 and Community Response Plan meetings, which means we are responding to those families' needs on the ground when they're needed with the right help and support. We engage with brave families in consultations, reviews of policies, development of literature and training and design delivery. We have a communication network with brave family members across sectors and groups of organisations. Um, we work very closely with COS who support carers of those with difficulties with their mental health. And we raise awareness about post-vention needs through sharing our lived experiences. Over the years, we have had great successes and I'm gonna share some of those with you now. So we were involved in the co-development of guidelines for speaking publicly about lived experience of suicide. We contributed to the PHA guidance on public memorials for family members. We were involved in developing 
of a training video for the police about sudden death procedures. And we had several family members who had been recently bereaved who took part in that to tell their stories and why that help and support was so important for them. We have contributed to the evaluation and the update of the SD1 process. So these are the SD1 process is um, sudden death process where police will go to the scene of someone who has died. They will complete paperwork and one of those is a, a form that gets completed with the family's details and whoever else may need support. So that can be offered very, very quickly on the ground. And that support is what works for those individuals and those families who need it. We ensure that the Protect Life 2 strategy retains a focus upon reducing the suicide rates in Northern Ireland and with a recognition of prevention as a prevention measure. And we have developed a very positive working relationship with the Chief Medical Officer and with our Health Minister. <clears throat> so next, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why bereavement by suicide is different. Um, the reason that why we do what we do is that bereavement by suicide is very different to any other death because your loved one chose to end their own life and that's really difficult to get your head around. It's also more complicated by the circumstances of the loss. It's finding the body of the deceased. There's a formal investigation process by police coroner will be involved and sometimes there needs to be an inquest and depending if that person was being seen by mental health teams in their local trust area the trust can be involved to complete a serious adverse incident inquiry this is all so stressful for a family who've been bereaved who are traumatized and grieving so they need a little bit of help and support with that they'll have lots of unanswered questions what if if only what could I have done more of? Why didn't I see it? There's a lack of privacy, especially in communities when word gets out about a death and families don't feel that it's just their private lay to hold on to. And they worry about what other people are gonna say and what they're gonna think. There can be family and community tensions that arise because we all know that families aren't perfect. There are fallouts and when there's a death that can be made worse. And there can be post-traumatic stress symptoms for families. And that takes a lot of support and help for them to work through. We also know that families who've been buried by suicide are at a significantly higher risk of becoming suicidal themselves. And we need to be aware of that. And that's why it's vitally important that we put the support in place when it's needed. Okay. So the ripple effect of suicide. <clears throat> At first we thought that lower numbers would have been affected when there was a death by suicide. We now know that from one death up to 135 people are affected to some degree by that suicide. So in 2019 we had 197 registered deaths by suicide. That works out at 26,595 people who are affected by that death. The number that we have is has been revised because the Northern Ireland Statistic Research Agency and the coroner are looking at deaths, um, sudden deaths in relation to drugs. And some of those have been reclassified as drug deaths rather than suicide. And that goes to the, the burden of evidence and proving the proof being there that it was drugs or suicide. This new number of people affected by one suicide shows that far more people may need post-pension support than previously thought. It emphasizes how we must focus post-pension efforts on a broader group of people who may require support to reduce harm from suicide as those who have been exposed to suicide are at greater risk for themselves. It's vital that we increase our understanding about what post-pension is and to do that, we have to understand why being bereaved by suicide is different. Not that it's worse, it's different to other types of bereavement. And I think once we get our heads around that and we understand that, then we can start to 
give people that support that they need. I'm showing you a slide now of people who can be affected. So people who are exposed, and as you can see, first responders, so that police, ambulance, healthcare, close friends, family. People who can be affected, again, first responders, therapists, friends, classmates. People who are short, affected in the short term, so it will have an impact that will make them sad and upset and they may need to take a bit of time off work or school, you know, family, therapists, friends, and our colleagues. And then the long term. So that's going to be our family members, our therapists and close friends. We will hear later on from Sharon McDonald, who carried out research um, that our children and young people, it's been seriously underestimated, the impact on the death of a schoolmate on them. For them, it can be like losing a close family member and it does increase their risk of becoming suicidal themselves and developing difficulties with stress and trauma. So we need to be aware of that and provide proper support for those kids. You know, we think there are areas that require action and improvement and we have been working towards this. So one of the things that we think need to happen is that there needs to be mandatory suicide prevention training for all frontline workers. So that's our doctors, our nurses, our receptionists in hospitals, our porters and our care assistants, teachers and youth workers, people who are on the ground who are providing support we need them to know what to look for and what to do if someone is showing signs that they may be thinking about suicide. We need a specialised response to crisis that is 24-7 across the region in every hospital or every community that people know how to access it and access it quickly. There needs to be a safe space for crisis assessment to take place and that's not necessarily always going to be in the hospital. What we have found is hospital is not always the best place for someone who is in crisis, who's struggling with their mental health or who is thinking about suicide. It's busy, it's chaotic, there's lights, there's noise, there's people. That just adds to the stress that that person's already feeling and if they don't get seen fast enough, they can leave the hospital, which doesn't always have a good outcome. We really want for families to be involved in safety planning and assessment processes as a partner in the care of their, their loved one. Families know their loved one best. They know their good days and their bad days. They pick up things that the person themselves won't. They're the ones that are there at nighttime on weekends when all the services are closed. So they need to be part of that process. So it needs to be a triangle of care where it's the person who needs the support, their families, and in the services that are there to help them. We want to see an offer of specialist postvention support that's made flexible and repeatedly to those who've been affected by suicide. Because sometimes as fam families, they're not ready after two weeks or three months or six months. It can be a year or two years or 10 years down the line where they need support. So we need to make sure that that support is there for them when they need it. We need information and interventions to be available for children and young people across the country, regionally. That's easy to access. Doesn't matter where they live or what their age is. You know, if you're 17, you still need that support and there have to be better processes to transfer from adolescent support to adult care. We also would like to see a move towards a psychological autopsy approach to the serious adverse incident inquiries. Because as I said earlier, they're so traumatic for families. And when they're first approached, they're not in a place to be able to answer those questions and to feel like they're being involved. And later down the line, they have lots of questions and they're maybe not happy with the process, but they don't know what to do. If we can have this approach, the psychological autopsy, then that will be more supportive and inclusive of the family's needs. And we need to make sure that there's fluid funded cross-sector pathways of support. And that's not just about 
our hospitals and our GPs and our mental health teams. That's about our community and voluntary sector as well and everyone working together because only then can we properly tackle the problems that are there for us. There are lots of opportunities for change that we, we feel are there. We're really positive about that and excited for the work going forward. So we have been working with RQIA and there has been consultation and reviews taking place of the serious adverse incident review, um, review and there's an evaluation being done on that. There's also an urgent care and crisis team review that the Department for Health have set up um, and Christine Bateson is the chair of that and we've recently met with her and we'll be meeting with her again. We have the Towards Zero Suicide um, model that is in all of our hospitals now um, which is about changing things and changing those attitudes and perceptions in hospital of all of our staff. We have been involved in safety planning, staff training and suicide prevention pathways. We've also been involved with the training matrix rollout. So that's work that's been taking place with public health agency around what suicide prevention training is there, how it's accessed and it's tiers. And it's about having again that pathway that people can sort of start and do what's appropriate for them. We've got the implementation of the Protect Life 2 strategy with our action plan. There's lots of work going on around that, but there's a lot more that we can do. We have the development of the mental health strategy that again, Family Voices Forum have been involved in and we're putting in our response to the consultation as well and involved with several other places to do that. And again, please, if you can, respond to it. There's the regional model of the post pension support that's being looked at which is really positive. And actually we feel that resources need to be made available to provide that post-vention support. And also post-vention support needs to be made a specialized intervention that's standalone to make sure that the people who need that support and help get it when they need it. And there's also the emotional wellbeing framework for our children and young people that's being carried out through the Department of Health and the Education Authority, which is joint working between our two departments. And actually we feel that suicide prevention isn't just a health issue. Every single one of our departments and agencies should be working together because suicide affects everyone and can be triggered by a number of different facts. So researching lived experience of suicide we feel there are a few things that need to happen. So we would like, when we're curating those with lived experience or doing that research, that the researchers looked at, look at people who have lived experience or have lived experience themselves. People don't just wanna be the subjects of research. They wanna be actively involved. They want their voices to be heard. They want to see that change happen. We want to work together to ensure that information about the research study, study is shared in a manner that is accurate and easily understood. We took part in some research last year with some of our families and we had to sort of tinker with the, the description of it a little bit so it made sense to the families that we were working with and that they knew what they were going to be talking about to the researchers. We want to be prepared and we want the researchers to be prepared to hear highly distressing and emotionally charged, sometimes angry personal stories. They're not easy to hear, they're very stressful and you need to be in a good place yourself to hear those and you need support afterwards to keep you safe. And that's why everybody involved needs to have the right support. And that can be different for all of us. The contribution that people make needs to be valued and feedback that's given to the participants about how they've done and about what the outcomes of that research might be and how that moves forward. And we need researchers to understand that participation by lived experience is often seen by participants as therapeutic and positive and sometimes a healing experience. So sharing their stories and what's happened for them can help them in the longer term. 
there are challenges and often for some people it will be the first time that they've had the opportunity to tell their story it may not always be ideal which is really important why we have that support there for them research often requires current info but the bereaved are often not emotionally available until several years after their loss people will offer to volunteer for in-depth re research and a review of what happened only once so they'll do it and then they don't want to do it again because it's been too much the first time and it depends on the approach that's taken with them but that reduces the number of people who we will have to be able to move that forward a lot of our work and the people who who volunteer for us often work full time as well so it's trying to work things out that they can do it at evenings or weekends and work around their family needs as well and they need safe time and space to be able to participate and we need to make that available for them and there can be barriers that are involved when you're working with professionals with lived experience just some things that we need to be aware of and we need to take account of. And finally, this is a quote from one of our family members involved with the forum. And what they said was that it is our aim to ensure that by speaking our unique and individual truths, we contribute to a future that inspires and empowers individuals and communities and is filled with hope and meaning. And you'll see our snowdrop there, which is the logo for Family Voices Forum. And it's the symbol of death, hope and new beginnings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. That was a wonderful presentation. Very, very powerful. Um, I'm sure you get that all the time. Very powerful. It sounds like a cliche, but it really, really is. Every time we hear from people with lived experience, it reminds us what important experts you are and the importance of um, hearing your voice in all of the, in all of these discussions and webinars. So thank you so much. And it was lovely to see the snowdrops. The snowdrops are out at the minute, giving us all a wee bit of hope um, at, at the current time of the pandemic. So it's it's nice that that's also your logo and it's such a hope for local so thank you so we're going to have some questions now and we have um we're asking you for some questions in our chat if you have any i can't see too many there i've got i've got a few here for you um and for karen as well if you want on my like yourself uh, there's a couple of things i would i would like to ask you about and get your thoughts on um so i suppose the first one is you know we've heard from from claire and Claire's very experienced in talking about what it's like to be bereaved by suicide. But the main message or one of the main messages I, I took away from that was um, the important, you know, the importance of protecting people with lived experience. It's really important we involve them. But I think there was a message there about how vulnerable people are. And I would just like to hear some more, you know, as we set up a suicide prevention research network, Claire, we really want to do this right Okay, so we want to, we really want to involve people. So what would your kind of guidelines would be for us? Um, you know, people come forward very quickly often, and I get this as well, the media talking to me about mental health issues, people come forward with their own experiences, and you find that they've very recently been bereaved. What would, what would your advice be, um, you know, in, in terms of how, how we support people and what we advise them and whether we, we allow them and, and where those boundaries are? For me personally, I think to begin with, when a family are very recently bereaved, maybe within that first year, depending on what support they've had, that it may not be an ideal time for them to be involved with interviews or research because it's still very fresh and still very close to home for them. Mm -hmm. They're still very traumatised by what's happened and nothing is really the same for them. Ian, they're still adjusting and they have lots of firsts to overcome. And actually the second year that can be really really difficult for them as well because they know what to expect so it's nearly worse but if they do want to take part if people do want to take part making sure that it's very clear what the research is about the very clear questions that they can have in advance you know if they can see the questions in advance it can help them decide whether they want to take part or whether they don't you know making sure that there's support in place afterwards you know we all we obviously did the um Samaritans work earlier last year mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and with the family members who took part in that we spoke to them beforehand Mm -hmm. we asked for the questions and we got them to give to them so they could read through them so they knew what they were going to be talking about and then we were there to provide support for them afterwards and that's worked really really well Mm -hmm. because they felt supported they felt they had someone to be able to talk to Mm-hmm. So I think those things are really, really important. But it's also, I think, for the researchers as well, you need to be prepared and know what these stories are going to sound like and what impact they're going to have on you. You can be really prepared for it. I've been doing this for a long time. And when I'm during my day-to-day work, it's grand because I'm prepared and I know what to expect. But we delivered food parcels a couple of Saturdays ago. And a lot of the families we were delivering them to wanted to talk had things they wanted to say. I wasn't prepared for that. And I wasn't prepared. I think I delivered 40 parcels that day. And I wasn't prepared to be talking to each one of them about something that had happened. And I went home absolutely emotionally exhausted. So you have to be aware of that for yourself as well and have things in place to protect yourself and to support yourself as a researcher too. Because then that helps the person with lived experience who's lost someone because you're not going to be emotional emotional and very emotive in relation to what they're saying so it's protecting yourself but it's protecting them too Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah those are some those are good points and I get I get that a lot as well Claire you know with people coming to me and they're very angry and they're angry at mental health services Uh and um, I'm in the receiving end of that anger because of what I represent you know so it's really hard to try and keep that just keep that sort of healthy distance and realize it's not about us personally. You know, the person yeah. that, that we're, we're, we're witnessing, we're bearing witness to that suffering and that anger. We haven't necessarily caused it, but, you know, it's it's our role to sit with that and, and to yeah. be with that person. Um, I'm thinking, Karen, is is this a, is there a suggestion there that we might want to develop policies and guidance um, as part of our suicide prevention research network for um, how we protect people with lived experience and involve them in our research and what we do? Do you think that's a good idea? I think that is a brilliant idea. Thanks so much, Claire. And as I sat listening to you, I was reflecting on some of the research interviews that I've been involved in as well and and um, I completely agree with everything you've said um, and that you know it it does it takes a toll on the researcher it takes a toll on the participant and it is really really important that not only uh, you know it is that fine balance isn't it because I mean when you go through the process of getting ethical approval for a research project of course you have to have things in place to support people Um, and quite often you'll find that ethics committees are you know that they could do with hearing your presentation Claire as well you know they need more information they need supported and they need to understand the fine balance here because it is so important to hear the voices and yet it's so important also to support people so um, I, I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. And um, it is so, so, I'm so pleased that we have already representation from Family Voices Forum in the network development group. And I think it's a brilliant idea to put that forward. I think it would be useful for other researchers, useful for, for people, you know, we could, we could think about what, what sort of direction do we want that advice to, to be pitched? Do we want to, to produce advice for ethics committees? Because as you said, quite rightly said, Claire, people can find the process of being involved in research really therapeutic. Um, I, I know I have spoken to a couple of people as a researcher and they, probably not initially, but eventually they'll say, you know, this is the first time I've talked about this. And, you know, your jaw can drop and you think, my goodness, is so privileged mm-hmm. to be on the receiving end of this story, this, this experience and to have that shared. So I think it is a great idea and let's get it on our network agenda. Perfect. And we're happy to deliver to the ethics committees or to give them a copy of the presentation to help them on the process. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. And Jar McDonald's also saying there that, um, that they, it's essential that we do this and maybe Sharon would be able to, because you've got more experience as well and, and maybe even protocols that you would already use and guidance. So that would be really, really useful if, if we could avail of those. <laughs> 
Um, in terms of the media, I, I wanted to ask Claire as well. You know, the media interviews um, where, and I've been, I've been the victim of this. You know, I'm on talking, and they've got somebody who's incredibly vulnerable sharing a story on air, um, and it's very emotional. And I just wonder, is that wise? You know, and how do you navigate this? Because people obviously have the right to talk about their experiences as adults and make their own decisions about when to share. But would you, is there a time period that you would recommend? Would you go as far as to recommend that um, that the producers don't, you know, don't involve vulnerable people in these sorts of interviews? Or, and what did your PHA guidance recommend there? You know, because you, you were involved in that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think for me, um, you know, we wouldn't be recommending that families in the first couple of years would speak to media because it is, and I've had experience of this myself where I've had families who've spoken to media quite recently after their loss and afterwards they regret it. And then there will be things caught and it will be tailored for what the media want to use it for. And that's really frustrating for them. It's very upsetting as well. And um, so what we would do is I will sit with our families and chat with them first of all and find out what it is what message they want to get out there and you know then speak to the media whether it's paper news uh radio or tv and be very clear with them what what this family need to say and what's okay to say and what's okay to ask them and what's not and I will be there with them so if I feel that the person who's doing the interview is stepping over the boundaries I'll step in to stop them and um, if it's going to be in a newspaper I'll always ask for them to send it to the family and myself so that we can look at it before it's published so that there's anything that it can be taken out that we're not happy with um I've been the victim of that with media in the past as well where I spoke to the BBC and other people then took copies of it and put it in media and twisted it to their own story to fit what they wanted to write and maybe sensationalise things and that's not okay because there, we have to have a responsibility and the media have a responsibility as well not to cause panic or distress mm -hmm. to anyone and sometimes those stories that they print or they show can cause distress and that's not very responsible. There are media guidelines that the Samaritans have published which are fantastic and each media outlet should have copies of those and I know public health agency have done training at our universities and further education colleges with reporters for those. And it's just something that we always need to be reminding them of as well. Um, if a family really does want to do it, supporting them through that is really, really important and making sure that they're not taken advantage of or exploited mm -hmm. for the media's own points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's been really, really useful. Claire, well, we're going to um, take a little break now, okay? We might get you back on because I'm keen to hear about your experiences on the ground as well in terms of the coronavirus pandemic and the impact <sighs> on people. But we, we're going to talk about that in more detail as the theme of the next, um, it's particularly the theme of Rory's presentation. So we'll maybe just have a break and, and have that conversation um, afterwards, if that's all right. Okay, so thanks everybody. Um, and we will have you back on again at about one o'clock if that's okay. And I'm gonna stop recording now. All right, thank you. Research and practice. So it took us three years to prepare this study. As I said, we did it in our spare time and we didn't have spare time really. We got ethical approval from the University of Manchester. We piloted it and then we developed Help Is At Hand. I know you've got a Northern Ireland version, but three members of our team were involved in that. And we also developed a website because we knew this was a, a very high risk group that we was engaging in. And in relation to children, um, we put lots of measures in place so that if anyone was under 18, that they would be taken out of the system and we would take them to Winston's Wish, uh, which is a bereavement charity for children. However, I would argue the reality is children are young, but they're not stupid. If they wanted to get into this survey and fill it in, they would just go back in and say they were over 18. And we, we were mindful of that, but we couldn't control that. So a quick overview of the survey, there was uh, 71 questions, uh, a lot of free text, uh, we, anyone bereaved or affected could fill it, fill it in. 
uh, and so we, we would look at ethnicity, demographic information, um, etc. And then what we actually did was, um, it was a bit like a funnel really, we'd ask general questions, all of it difficult, but then we would say if they've lost more than one person, please can you focus on one and, and answer these really difficult questions uh, because we want to understand the total, totality of, of the experience of losing one person by suicide. I can't tell you how difficult these were, but they filled it in. So I'm going to talk now about the power of public engagement because, wow, when you get this right and the general public engaging in, in your research, this is when the best work is done. So I did 67 presentations across the UK. It's been referred to in Westminster. I was on uh, BBC Breakfast, radio. But I've got to say, Twitter is where we recruited the most. I don't know if any of you have heard of Neville Southall. Um, he's a footballer. He was instrumental in, in recruiting most of the men. He was on most days recruiting. Um, and, and we also asked people to upload videos to encourage people to take part. So in relation to uh, this study, 9,744 people opened the online survey. 1,699 didn't answer, provide any answers, but I think these were looking at the survey, deciding whether or not to take part at a later date. Of the remaining 8,045, 887 were excluded. Now I've highlighted the children. 64 were under 18. This demonstrate what jumps out to me on this. Children want to take part. It's us as adults that are struggling to hear the answers. So I really, you know, the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing. So in total, 7,158 people filled in the survey. This is the largest suicide bereavement uh, survey internationally. I want to refer to, so here by accident, um, the, the Northern Ireland, or all the percentages are a reflection of the 2011 census. So the 3% the for Northern Ireland is an accurate sort of percentage when you put us all together. So 213 people from Northern Ireland have filled this survey in. Um, what, so 21% of men, this is a big deal. We know women take part in this kind of research, which is the largest sample of men bereaved by suicide internationally that have filled a survey in. And I want to show you here, I'm not going to go in detail with these graphs. So the age was between 18 and 84. But what I want to highlight to you, we have data for those aged 18 and 24, the age group that you're interested in, 625 of that age group are filled in this survey, priceless data. Again, I'm not going to go into this, I'm just doing things that jump out to me for, in relevant to your work. We have 400 completed surveys of full-time students. We know nothing about these. We've got this data here that needs analysing. So in relation to frequency of being bereaved or affected by suicide, two thirds of reported being bereaved are affected by one suicide. A third had experienced a death by suicide in their personal or professional life. And the number of, uh, so, 7% had experienced between four and 70 deaths. They, so the large number is police, the crime scene investigators, but a lot of families have lost four, five people. And this is what jumps out, which should jump out to you. Those in Northern Ireland are more likely to have experienced more than one suicide compared to the rest of the UK. So I'm now going to look at, we then ask these people to focus on one. So if they'd lost four people, we ask them to choose one, not the one they love the best or anything, just they could choose, but we wanted to understand the totality of the experience. I'm not going to go in details again, but I want to highlight stuff that's relevant to you. Friends, we don't think about friends being bereaved by suicide. That was the largest sample that the effort friends go to keep their friends alive is, is, is unreal and, and not recognised. The majority, 
uh, in relation to losing someone to suicide? Was that did I, it was either a major or moderate impact? And then I want to, to highlight, I'm just looking at my ta time, okay. So uh, in relation to social adverse life events, 39% had reported experiencing adverse social life events, 24% two or more, 12% three or more, 6% four or more. So you can see it's not just the death, it's like a domino effect. So all these other things impact them. 49% of adverse consequences relating to their health, 30%, 31% two or more, and it goes on. 3% were hospitalized for mental illness. And what I would argue, this is highlighting, we need uh, the urgency, we need multi-agency working with these, with these people. In relation to attempting suicide, 8% of attempted suicide. And look at this, loss of parent or friend was the most common reason, or, or those were the ones that are more likely to attempt suicide. And again, I wanna highlight the remaining 36% attempted suicide a year or longer. So we, these people need support, not just at the early stages, but around the first anniversary. High risk behavior. I'm, I'm mindful because I've got to keep to time uh, and you'll be getting this filmed. So I'm gonna look at the, the, the age group that you're interested. So high risk behavior, more often they're under 25 years and are male. And they normally engage in a lot of this uh, uh, over around the first anniversary. So in relation to high risk behavior, in relation to the, those under 25, they're more likely to engage in dr drug and alcohol misuse and aggressive behavior. Interestingly, there's no gender difference in relation to aggressive behavior, but it's more likely to be those under 25. So we looked at impact and the loss of, um, and we can, we've analyzed this data in different categories. Uh, let me just look at the time. Oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to be quick. So loss of a friend, um, 1,024, tended to be male, younger than other respondents, likely to have lost more than uh, two suicides and engage in self-harm and illicit drugs. Parents, again, you know, if parents are struggling, children in that family will be struggling as well. So you can see this here. Loss of a son of a daughter, it goes on. Sibling, if you lose a sibling, look at the impact it has. But I wanna highlight this one. If someone loses a spouse or a partner, they have a catalog of problems. And again, you need to be mindful, children are in these families. And if the, the, the single partner, parent is struggling to cope this is what the things that they're dealing with so I would argue you know uh, you should be commended for what you're doing working with children because it's too difficult for most people to go near so I would say the survey has created a tsunami of hope and expectations 7,158 people bereaved or affected by suicide are finding the collective voice they no longer want to be invisible and hope sharing their vulnerabilities will influence change. And what I would argue, government and communities need to listen, acknowledge, and more than that, they need to act. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was, that was amazing. And uh, thanks for staying to time as well. There's a lot of stuff there we could do a whole way. But I, I know it's filmed, so, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, I'm trying to, yeah, sorry. So really good. Can you tell us the charity who were very proactive and organised the training in Northern Ireland? Because they need to be commended too. Do you I know can't them? remember the name, and I don't know if I'm allowed to tell for data, uh, yeah. data protection. I'm not sure. But do you know what? They're shaming the government you know and by the way i forgot to mention i'm not very politically correct my work's personal and professional and the charities shouldn't be having to scrot about getting money to to educate you know uh these people the government should be stepping up you know or the nhs trusts you know and and, it, and i honestly think it's shameful that that it's there's a charity has to lead by example and, and i might be out of order saying that but I can't say which organisation has commissioned it, but, you know, 
credit to them, I think. Yeah, no, Sharon, you're not stepping out of line. You're absolutely right. What I'm going to do is go back to the, um, is it the, always a fun, the issue of who should actually pay for this stuff here, but it needs to be delivered as part of our Protect Life 2 strategy. So definitely that's an action point I'm going to take away from this and we're going to raise with the Protect Life Strategy Steering Group and the Chief Medical Officer and the, um, the Minister for Health if necessary as well. I think it's just something that's important that, that's not happening, that really needs to be happening in Northern Ireland, especially as we go through the pandemic. Do we have any... Um, any questions for Sharon specifically around that? Anybody want to come forward? Can I ask then, yeah. if no one's asking questions, uh, Siobhan, uh, now this, this really annoyed me, but I'm going to deal with it. But uh, we wrote this report and, and can I ask people to look at it and, and if you know of anyone of influence at government level or whatever, give it to colleges, give it to, uh, when you read, has anyone, just out of curiosity, anyone that's here, has anyone read it? Claire, you must have read it, have you? Uh, oh, brilliant. Uh, let me tell you, this has really annoyed me. This has not received, this, this report has not received any media attention. Not one sentence, not one sentence. Well, that's all right, I haven't finished now. If I can do a study for nothing, I'll deal with this one. If the, so what has actually happened, a lot of bereaved people, the self-esteem, the self-worth, you know, the hard to engage, uh, you know, hard to find. And they've just, on Twitter, they've just emotionally invested in this. And what for? Nothing, because it's not even got in the newspapers. Well, I will deal with that. And people like you, Siobhan, that have got influence, we need to fire, we need to come together and fire fire everybody up because they need if they won't engage in it well then they need to be shamed into doing it and i and i feel sad that that's the way it's going so sorry for my rant but you shouldn't have invited me <laughs> no we should have invited you you're absolutely right because whenever we talk about groups that are at risk of suicide in northern ireland the, the group of people who are bereaved by suicide rarely are actually mentioned and i think and i can see there's a couple of political representatives um are around today and, and this so this is something maybe they could bring forward but I think that's that's a very powerful take-home message is that we need to, even if we just raise public awareness of the risk because that's how change happens that's that's how um that's how we get things like training and Claire has come back to everyone saying the group um are in, in the Southeastern Trust. So they may well be, yeah, and they spoke about doing it yesterday. So so they are able to talk about that. But so so let's get that and let's lobby, lobby so that we can get that funded in Northern Ireland. Maybe we could have a conversation offline and I'll get a policy officer to contact you, Sharon, to find out how much it would cost and what we're talking about really here. Because once we have a sum of money, we can start to think about then, what, you know, who's going to um, actually pay for it. Claire, you have a question, yeah. Yeah, no, I did the PABS training a couple of years ago. Um, myself and Ari went over to England and did it, and we did come back and speak to PHA about it. And I know that there are a few others who have been over to do it as well. We think it should be delivered here, and we did speak to PHA in Belfast about that. So it is something needs to go into our training matrix to be delivered, because there isn't a great deal of um, postvention training that's done here or anyone else, or any, sorry, anywhere else. And it's really, really useful. We use it every single day. So with the families that we work with, so it's really, really good. So, yeah. So you know what? I think, you know, when is it a, a suicide is complicated, you know, so we think this, that we have to have complicated solutions. The problem, the solutions in the problem, ask these people and they'll tell you. And that report, Internationally, uh, Australia, America, they're all, all over it. And I would challenge any minister that reads that, that argues that these people shouldn't be looked after because it's all right anecdotal stuff or, or, or these people. This is research. It's the largest internationally and it's shocking. And, and so, uh, you know, I, ju I just want... So I just want people to just just read it and then make your own mind up. But it's like you, Siobhan, it's research and it's evidence. And that's more powerful, I think, to influence policy. But it's just engaging with these people. So thank you, Siobhan, for saying you'll, you'll try to engage them.
Oh, no, absolutely. We will. I mean, we want to do it through the research network, but also that's part of my job now as a mental health champion. That, that's what I'm here to do. So it's it's really part of my role. Um, Sharon, do you have any reflections? Well, how many people did you say? 3% of the sample were from Northern Ireland. How many people did that represent? How many people was that? Uh, oh, I think it's I think it's 231. Now, you might be disappointed with that, but let me tell you, how can I put it? We dared ask. They knew we were bereaved. That We dared ask, and they knew we were doing it for nothing. And so goodwill generates more goodwill. And so they dared answer. So if you got any other comments, well, my God, we didn't restrict them to insult them by giving them 100 characters or something like that. You write what you want. So any other comments on one of the questions might be like, single line space and a page and a half. So I think, I can't remember, I think there's 230. This is priceless data uh, that we've got there for Northern Ireland and, and uh, it's there, but you know, there's a limit to what we can do for free. Do you know what I mean? Six years working in our spare time when we haven't got any, you know, governments need to step up now and cough up and, and get this data analyzed because it's it's, it's not just data, this data will save lives and, and it's a government priority, these people. That is fantastic, Sharon. So what we need to do is we need to get some funding so that we can analyze this data and use the learning that's in there that people have given their time and told us about their experiences because there must be stuff in there that could influence what we're doing here in Northern Ireland and the direction of travel here for sure. Great. Um, Claire? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we have noticed is there has been research carried out, but it sits on a shelf and nothing happens with it. We don't do anything with it. We don't actually use it effectively to create change. And that's why I think the research network is such a good thing, because it's about making sure that we implement the research that's there and create the change that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely yeah and I'm going to see what, how I can take forward both of those actions so in relation to training and access to that data I think it's actually immoral and unethical to um, you know have people participate in research potentially vulnerable people as well and then not use the evidence um, and, and not analyze it and take the learning from it so I, I think we're, we're really obliged to do that so thanks for that Sean. Um, so this is great. Now, I see we have Professor O'Connor here. Hi, Rory. Hi, Siobhan. Lovely Hi, to see everyone. you. Thanks for joining us today. So we're going to move on now to our next, um, to our next presentation. And that's from Professor Rory O'Connor from the University of Glasgow. And, and this is going in a slightly different direction, um, thinking about the current pandemic and the impact on mental health and of course, suicidal behavior, which is Rory's area of expertise. So Rory, you're sharing your slides, you're, you're away there and you've got about 20 minutes and I'll butt in if you go too far over your time. And we welcome questions for Rory or indeed any of the panel members in the chat. Thank you. Great, thanks Siobhan. And unfortunately, because I've been tied up all morning, I um, haven't had a chance to join. So it's great to see so many people on the Zoom call. Okay, as Siobhan has said, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about some of the work we've been doing on what's known as the UK COVID-19 Mental Health and Wellbeing Study um, very quickly over, the next, over 20 minutes and then maybe talk a bit more broadly at the very end about what we think might be the impact currently on um, the suicide rates um, across the UK and, and beyond. So this piece of work, um, the COVID mental health and wellbeing study grew out of really some of our thinking very early on in the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic. So it looked in those days after the COVID, uh, or before lockdown, but when COVID was on the horizon in the, in the mid-March, um, I was involved in this group um, convened by the uh, Academy of Medical Sciences and MQ Research and Mental Health Research Charity. And we spent really then in the early days of COVID putting together what we thought was the mental health research priorities for COVID-19 because our concern was that that although all understandably in those early days of the pandemic all the focus was on um, on physical health and obviously the impact of the virus that we were concerned that mental health may may have been missed so this paper then as part of it this sort of setting the priorities really urged us all to try and think about monitoring or putting in place better monitoring and reporting procedures 
for um, all aspects of mental health. So I'm going to focus in on really what we describe as sort of common mental health problems like anxiety and depression. But in that paper, really, our focus was really trying to get a better handle on the, the, the um, general population impact or otherwise of COVID-19. And it's not it's beyond monitoring and mental health this paper talks about, but I'm just going to focus in on our attempts then to try and get some sense of levels of symptoms of anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviors um, across the UK. Because as we know, there are established monitoring obviously of, of suicide rates themselves, and obviously in Northern Ireland being a great example of monitoring of self-harm, hospital treated self-harm, which obviously is really great, but doesn't include obviously um, self-harm necessarily which happens in the community, which doesn't require hospitalization. So say that's the sort of broad context. And then we very quickly secured funding from Samaritans in Scotland, the Scottish Association of Mental Health, and a, 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 a charity Mindset Foundation who supports some of our research on the back of sadly um, a family who lost um, their son to suicide. So in collaboration funded with also the University of Glasgow, we initially, our aim was to investigate the immediate and medium term impact of the pandemic. And obviously the impact of, of social distancing and then in the longer term, the impact obviously of the social and health uh, or the economic impact of obviously the lockdown and uh, restrictions more broadly. So we were unable to obviously set up a probability sample because ideally if you're doing a study of this kind, you want to put together a probability sample of the population, but just to get, we wanted to get the field as soon as possible so we can get as close to the start of lockdown to get a baseline measure of our mental health and wellbeing across the UK. Now, so our data, we cannot say anything about our sample from pre-pandemic. Other studies are trying to do that. But our strength of our study is trying to look at changing trajectories of mental health and well-being in our national sample. So we put together, we recruited um, a sample of 3,000 adults. It was a quota-based sample based on age, sex, socioeconomic background, and region of the UK. So we have obviously got a sample from Northern Ireland, but uh, probably it's a small number of people because obviously we only have, even with a, a sample of 3,000, I think we've got about 100 people from uh, Northern Ireland. But if we just look across the different the four regions of the, of the UK, we see a similar pattern of findings. So what I'm telling you today is applicable um, to the, um, the Northern Ireland context as well. Initially, we only we, we plan to get to do six time points, so um, five follow-ups after baseline to cover the first six or seven months of the pandemic. But we've now decided to extend that, and we're now just currently collecting data in the field or looking at which is effectively wave seven now of the pandemic or of our follow-up, um, which will tap into what's happened to obviously what's going on now. Okay, somebody thinks who's might want to mute themselves there. I think somebody's um, got, is on a call, I think. What I'm going to talk about though for the remainder of my time is focusing primarily in, in waves one to three of the study. And waves one to three cover that period um, from the start of the pandemic. So we were able to get ethics approval and our study all in place by the 31st of March. So that's obviously technically about a week after when the lockdown was covered, was called, the formal lockdown was, co was called, but much of our questions are asking about the previous week or two weeks. So it covers that very start of the pandemic and it did, as I say, from ways one to three, bring us up to mid-May. At the very end, I'll give you some insights. I'll give you some preliminary data we've got up into wave five, which is October of this year. I'll give you some idea. And these, these findings we're going to talk about are the main findings are covered in a paper uh, which is currently in press in the British Journal of Psychiatry. And so, obviously, a good team effort here with colleagues across the UK. Okay, so this just to give you a sense of the sample. So, um, actually, it's less than 100, so about 61 people in Northern Ireland in this study. Sorry, um, so, but just broadly representative of the UK population. Now, in terms of thinking back to what was going on then, just as a quick reminder, the three waves I'm talking about just in red here, waves one, two, and three, are that period where we're, we're in the heart of lockdown. So it's the first six weeks of lockdown when we're still adjusting to obviously the, the, I mean, the absolute major shock um, and then really trying to adjust to um, obviously the new life that we were all 
and countering on with us. None of us are aware that it would be still, we would be in the midst of a lockdown now. But I think these findings are particularly relevant now because of that very reason that we're in a lockdown currently. Um, uh, but what's also remarkable is that our, our follow-up rates are really, really good. So even by wave three, our, set, our third data point, we've got about 85% of the sample. It's also worth noting though that we also have a second sample not going to talk about today, which is a Scottish only sample called SCOBID, which we've got about two and a half thousand people um, in Scotland, in addition to the 3,000 we've got in, the, in our UK sample. So in terms of what we find, let me just talk a bit about the trajectory for depressive symptoms, for symptoms of anxiety, and then I'm going to focus in on really the suicidal thoughts data, which I think are, are quite interesting and potentially give us cause for um, a little concern in some groups of people in particular. So just a bit more detail on the sample, just, just to reassure you that although these are weighted demographic characteristics, we didn't have the, the weights that were applied weren't, um, we, we had broadly speaking, a represent, representative sample before added weights. And then as I say, that's just our Scottish only sample as well. So in terms of the data, so what was start was probably two key findings with regard to anxiety and symptoms of depression. So again, consistent with other studies out there, we saw this marked decrease in symptoms of anxiety in the first three waves of the survey. So again, that's um, we know that people had this absolute shock at the start. So we can get about 21% of the sample here reporting levels which above the cutoff for the GAD7 would indicate caseness or concern of um, potential psychiatric level of symptoms of anxiety. And then that decreases markedly, a significant reduction over those first three waves. And um, it's worth noting that there's published data now suggesting that not specifically for the GAD7, but for the PHQ9, which is our index of depressive symptoms, is that we reckon that that cutoff, again, as a 10 cutoff for the PHQ9, it probably is an overrepresentation of doubling of um, caseness for depressive symptoms because there's recent meta-analysis suggesting when you compare the scores on the PHQ9 with clinical interviews, you're let, you'll get probably much less um, caseness in a clinical interview than you do in the depressive symptoms. So even though in this slide here on the depressive symptoms, we've got about a quarter of people um, scoring above the cutoff. I, I would suggest that's not, we do not have evidence that a quarter of the people have clinical diagnosis for depressive symptoms. But having said that, it still indicates so that there are high levels of distress out there or where at the start of the pandemic. So although there is a decrease from 26% to 23 odd percent over the first three waves, that's not a statistical reduction. So our conclusion from this slide is, at one stage, you see at the same stage, you see a reduction in uh, symptoms of anxiety, whereas symptoms of depression are relatively stable. And then that's really interesting when we look at suicidal thoughts. Uh, I'll come on to in a second, but basically, as you'll see, that there's a different pattern from suicidal thoughts. But before we get on to the suicidal thoughts and self harm data, just to reiterate that we still see this huge recovery, quick recovery, still um, high levels. But at the same, looking at the feet and entrapment, which is two constructs we do quite a lot of work on, we see, we see recovery in the same way you saw with levels of symptoms of anxiety. Now, the next slide has got um, self-harm and suicide attempts data on it. Now, we can't say much about that because the numbers are relatively small. So we've, we've applied no statistical analysis to these, but what's still even just a eyeballing these data, it's clear that there seems to be some evidence of an increase in self-harm and suicide attempts going from wave one to wave two, and that's probably relatively stable. Now, this is something we'll continue to monitor, but we have to really caveat any finding or any conclusions here, recognizing that these are really small numbers of individuals we, um, given our sample size. Okay, so, but it still suggests there's something going on with what, um, in terms of maybe suicide risk. So we then just hone in on the suicidal thoughts data. So it's asking people, have they thought about suicide in the last week? The concerning bit for us was we see this increase from ways one through to two through to three. Now that marked increase, the significant increase really is from one to two, uh, ways one to two, and uh, there's also an increase, a significant increase from one to three, but not from ways two to three. But what's noteworthy here is, remember, if you think about this, in the context of our depressive symptoms and 
symptoms of anxiety data is anxiety levels are decreasing, levels of depression are relatively stable. So in that backdrop, you're starting to see this increase in suicidal thoughts, which arguably is counterintuitive. But I think what's going on here is the depressive symptoms and symptoms of anxiety are tapping into the past. Because if you look at how they're assessed, they often ask people to think about what happened in the last couple of weeks, how they were feeling in the last couple of weeks. Whereas I would argue, if you do think about suicidal thoughts, it projects you to the future because you're making, you're thinking about, my God, life is perhaps so unbearable. So I think that social and economic uncertainty and concerns are being tapped here by the suicidal thoughts data. And indeed, then, if we then focus in on some of the more fine-grained demographic findings, we see this very clear effect. Again, it's been reported in other studies that we see that young people are much more marked uh, in terms of the impact on them for suicidal thoughts. Uh, and, and although these differences are not significant for males versus females, there's a trend towards females reporting higher levels of suicidal ideation. So clear impact there of obviously an age effect, as we know, young people are being ad more adversely affected, their mental health is more ad adversely affected than other groups. If we then look at obviously socioeconomic background, again, we see this really clear effect of people from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds reporting significantly higher levels of suicidal ideation. And then we see an even clearer effect when we look at people with pre-existing mental health problems. I mean, that's stark clear by wave three, 6% of people who have um, no prior mental health condition are reporting suicidal ideation. And we've got 20% reporting it if you've got pre-existing mental health. Pre oh my God, whatever happened there. Um, so really start clear finding that we're not all in this together. The suicidal thoughts are much higher in people with more socially disadvantaged backgrounds, more young people, and obviously from people with pre-existing mental health problems. Now we've also looked at other indicators or other groups and again, this is just focusing at the start of the pandemic. We get very similar findings when we redo the analysis for later in the pandemic. But this just illustrates, again, no real surprises here. If your employment status had changed at the start of the pandemic, you're much more likely um, to report suicidal thoughts. Again, perhaps no surprise, those of you who have young families, if you've got dependents under the age of five in the household, higher levels of suicidal thoughts. And again, if before the pandemic started, if you weren't managing financially or struggling financially, again, you see this marked differential in suicidal thoughts. So again, clear evidence of this um, effect of mental health not being consistent across the um, different groups of people at risk. And again, this is just reiterating the exact same slide but a wave three. And again, we see, see a very similar finding even if you look at it, wave five. An interesting one, as we're in the current pandemic, is this is looking, asking people whether they have access to outside space. And what we see across all waves is if you had access, or sorry, if you didn't have access to outdoor space, your, your suicidal ideation levels were higher. But what's, what, what's noteworthy is this probably marked increase here by wave three. So we'll mean after six weeks of the lockdown, there seems to be this step change that really has an impact on your mental health and well-being. And so again, that I think has implications for how we hopefully come out of this pandemic or out of this lockdown, that obviously the longer it seems to be going on, those people who really are, have, have struggled to get access to outdoor space, they will be more affected. Again, if we move on and look at, um, again, looking at other indicators, defeat and entrapment again, which I would argue are part of the final common pathway to the emergence of suicidal thinking, Again, those with pre-existing mental health problems much, much more defeated, much more entrapped than, um, a, 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 than people without pre-existing mental health problems. And then if you look at the same slide, but this time for socioeconomic background, we see exactly the same effect. So with the people from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds, again, on defeat and entrapment are much more, um, much more affected than those who are obviously from more affluent backgrounds. So there's sort of the key sort of initial findings we published from these data from the first six weeks of lockdown. And last time, last coming up to obviously almost a year ago. So I want to present one slide on, on some sort of more detailed analysis we've done drawing specifically from, from the IMV model of mine. So obviously one of the key premises of the IMV model is this idea that entrapment is the path, the bridge between feelings of defeat and suicidal thinking. 
So again, we've just tested that using data from waves one, two, and three of the UK COVID study. And again, and consistent with the model, we see clear effect that not only is there this clear evidence of mediation between, of entrapment between defeat and suicidal ideation, but also consistent with a number of other studies, including work that we've conducted, that that sense of internal entrapment, that sense of internal mental pain of being overwhelmed that you're faded, that you're letting others down, that you're a burden on others, that internal mental pain is much more strongly associated with this pathway from defeat than external entrapment. Okay, so just to try and, um, that's all I'll say about waves one to three, but just to give you a, a wee bit of insight into what our latest data are telling us from up to waves five, one, two, three, four, and five. So these are data now up until actually August um, 2020. And again, what's noteworthy, again, this is what I've reported already, these up to um, the wave three, but we then see we're still seeing this increase. And I think that is concerning because waves four and five are when we were being eased out of lockdown. And so I think this one we need to look at in more detail. These are just preliminary analyses to see what's really going on. Because one would argue, why don't we see a reduction in suicidal ideation as lockdown and whatever was being released? Now, I think that's in part now still affecting the social consequences and economic consequences are obviously ongoing. And I think that's what's been reflected here. And indeed, if you look at the different age groups, again, we see the young people being much more affected still. And they're continuing to rise from wave three through to wave five. So this ongoing impact on our young people. And again, although it's not statistically significant, slightly higher levels amongst, um, amongst women. Okay, so that's obviously a lot of quantitative data. Just a couple of just quotes from a, a sister study we've, we've running, um, led by Katie Rowe, a colleague of mine at Glasgow. And we've done detailed interviews with um, a subsample of our population um, trying to understand the impact. And again, this first, we won't read the quotes word for word, but this first one I think really highlights, again, this fact that we're all, in, we're, we're, remember this is early on in, the, in May, June, still trying to understand what's going on. So it was almost like um, trying to get a grasp of what for life and it's like a, a lifeboat and you're really trying to navigate this new form of, of living. And then another person talks about um, I mean, wanting to get out, obviously, out, out more and more outdoors is just difficult, you know, not knowing when it's going to end. So that lack of control and that sense of entrapment is also specified here, which we think obviously is important when we think about the evolution and emergence of problems with mental health and suicide risk specifically. And then there's a third quote here from somebody who's actually had suicidal thoughts during lockdown. And thankfully, in this particular case, they really were struggling, but thankfully, a family member was around to keep them safe. But I think that's a really, I mean, vivid example here of, of obviously the real impact um, in somebody's life. And this obviously this lady, it's 18 to 24, who had a pre-existing mental health problem. Okay, in the last um, couple of minutes, and Siobhan, I know I'm just a minute or two over time, just wanna just share a few thoughts on obviously the broader impact of um, the pandemic. So to date, most of the research, published research out there has covered that early phase of the pandemic. And this is a great editorial published at the end of last year led by Anne John and colleagues and other colleagues. It's really, the evidence was broadly reassuring that the suicide rates hadn't really increased overall. And I think, I think that's probably safe to say in that initial, there was a sense of connect, togetherness and sense of belonging, um, which I think protected a lot of people, I think, initially. But our concerns are that as we move forward, I think that holding together, I think, is going to become under greater strain. And there are signals already that the suicide rates in some places have increased. And indeed, there's a lot of data now coming out of Japan suggesting an increase in suicide rate associated with obviously more latter time in the pandemic. Now, these are data up until um, August. And there's other studies that this, that this rise, rise is increasing and has been maintained. And indeed, what's noteworthy with these data from Japan is the impact on females and that the increase here is amongst, and marked amongst females, and so the suicide rate increasing there. Now, if we think more broadly about suicide in, in the UK, where we've now seen in many countries in the UK or many nations of the UK, we've started to see increases already 
pre-pandemic, but there has been this stark increase amongst females with women um, using more lethal methods of suicide. And we really need to get a better understanding more broadly of that. So I have a word of caution that although the, the rates initially were reassuring about, about suicide, I think there's enough science and there's some data also in Scotland and from child registers in England that there may be trouble ahead. So bringing this all together then, I'm really trying to illustrate really um, that uh, all the, uh, this, this is the wrong conclusion slide, sorry, that's the wrong slide, sorry, I apologize. The conclusion of this slide are, it's really important that we obviously continue to monitor the mental health and well-being of, of our population, but we need to use different indicators. And I've, I've looked at the differential effect of, on levels of anxiety, levels of depressive symptoms and suicidal thoughts. And it's absolutely crucial that now, as we recover from the pandemic, hopefully continue to recover, I think the effects are going to be much more long lasting. And when furlough ends and the other social safety nets are, are being taken away, I think the impact on the most vulnerable is, is going to be most marked. Because what's absolutely clear is, although some people haven't been affected, there's clear evidence that particular groups of people are being adversely affected. And we're not all in this pandemic together. And we need to obviously ensure that governments, all of us, continue to play our role in protecting those people who need help and support. Thank you. Fantastic, Rory. Thank you so much. I look like a one bush here. <laughs> um, that was a really great presentation, really, really useful information. Um, I have a couple of things I would like to, reflections, even thoughts coming from your research. Um, at the start of the pandemic, you know, there was no increase in suicide rates. Now we see that that is starting to happen in Japan. Um, do you do you think that the cultures are so widely different and the social policies are so different between here and Japan that um, we, we won't expect um, those kind of increases here? You know, uh, females are much less likely here to, to take their lives. Um, and the, the role, gender roles are somewhat different and there's different social safety nets here. Um, so would you be concerned that our rates are going to increase or do you think that Japan is a very particular culture, basically? No, I think we can learn. I think we can learn from Japan and I agree that there are marked cultural differences. But before the pandemic, um, we've started to see a rise across all parts of the UK in suicide. And I, I think it's the same in Northern Ireland in increases amongst females in suicides. And I don't know the data from Northern Ireland specifically, but we're starting to see that already. And my concern, the reason I think it is applicable is if you think of the groups of people who are mo who've been most affected um, in, in terms of the employment context, it tends to be occupations where there are more women than men in them. So caring professions, hospitality sector. So they're going to be much more affected. And women have had the disproportionate load of juggling, no matter what we talk about equality and, and, and sharing of gender roles, of doing a lot of the, more of the homeschooling and the caring stuff in addition to keeping their jobs and working productively. So I think, I think we, we have to be really vigilant. And, um, and, I, and I know certainly from the data from Scotland that, that, we, that we, we're starting to see, but we had our, incre our rates have been increasing already. So the problem we all have working in the field is, in the UK in particular, we'd started to see increases in suicides before the pandemic. So it's trying to um, disentangle the effect of the pandemic against this wider issue of social, social and health inequality. Um, I think that was your question. Yeah, no, that, that's that's a really good response. So so the answer is no, we're not that different from Japan, really. And we need to be very, very careful and cautious and, and apply interventions and be very watchful here. Just just in terms of the Northern Ireland suicide figures, we've seen a 10% decrease um, since the start of the pandemic, you know, but that's um, some, of, some of the figures are, there's a bit of a time lag there basically. And our numbers are, because, because the numbers are smaller, because the proportions that are smaller that we can't, you know, we can't look at gender differences just yet because it's, it's you know, only about 200 deaths every year. Yeah. So getting a statistically significant difference there, we need to look at a broader period of time. But it's certainly, it's certainly something that we've been interested in. That. What I want to do is ask Claire to come back in and reflect on her experience because it feels almost the ground it can feel like a lot of people are really in distress and feeling quite hopeless right now and I want just Claire to ask Claire how she's experiencing when she goes out and meets families and people who are vulnerable. Yeah I mean we have seen in the at the beginning of first lockdown in March 
not quite so bad. People were able to get out and about and do a wee bit more. Um, there were there was a lot of fear around then as well because we didn't know so much about COVID. I think as time has progressed, there we are seeing people with more anxiety, especially social anxiety, who have maybe been in lockdown and are absolutely yeah. terrified to go outside again. People who are afraid to go to a shop because they're terrified they're going to catch COVID. Um, we have seen moods drop, definitely, and more hospital admissions and GPs and mental health services being contacted. And a lot of community and voluntary sector organisations who are being contacted and our numbers would definitely be up. We're having to work in different ways, um, phone calls, video calling and what have you. And there's a better uptake with that and people are able to get access quicker to the services that they need. But I would say that, yes, we've definitely seen an increase in people needing support. But I think because we're able to get that support there quite quickly, we're not seeing the numbers of people dying, but we are seeing an increase in Belfast of females who have taken their own life over the last sort of year, which is something that we're watching very, very closely um, because that is something new for us. And actually in the methods that they're using as well, which are definitely more violent than they have been previously. So... I'm really interested in that the research from Japan and keeping an eye on that. And it is a bit worrying. And I think that we do have the mental health action plan and there is part of that for COVID, but we're definitely not doing enough and we need to do more because when this is over, there are businesses that are not going to reopen. There are people who are going to have lost their jobs. Families are going to break down. We know that there's a lot more domestic violence taking place because people are at home more, so, which is going to cause problems for people's mental health. So we need to be doing more now and we need to have a very clear thought out plan going forward on how we help and support people. Very good, Claire. That's been very useful. Of course, we need to be careful and cautious when we talk about this as well, because we know that how we talk about suicide can contribute to how people feel and can 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 actually, you know, exacerbate that sense of hopelessness sometimes as well. So we need to remain hopeful. Rory, I have an appointment to meet the Department of Health uh, on the 19th of February to go through the COVID response and what's needed now. So I want to get your views on what I should be highlighting to the department in terms of suicide prevention response and, and under one minute, if you can. No, we'll give you a couple of minutes, but just what are the policy, what are the well, imperatives now? Hold on, well, one of the messages I would, I would say just broadly is, and sort of speaking of what Claire said as well, is, so if you look internationally, most, I don't mean this pandemic, I'm thinking of other pandemics, and like under 1918 and, and all that, most of the fallout has been after the second wave, right? So when people have said, oh, we've been okay, we got through the first wave, right? So there's all about the second wave, and just people's been utterly, utterly scunnered or whatever the word you, we can say. Scunnered is an ordinary word, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, so but in terms of what we're, I think the, there's two two broad things I would say to you. One is the, obviously the crisis response. And as you know, obviously, that's something that is actively being explored by no, the Northern Ireland executive. So I think that joined up bits of um, now when people are in, not, I don't mean people, net, people who've, who've got, um, existing mental health problems, I'm hoping they're getting the help and support they've got. But there's going to be effect, like this whole generation of young people don't care what anybody says. I, we just got so much data that they've been adversely affected and we need to know how we can provide that hope. So I agree, we, ha we have to make sure we're not just talk, talking down, talking down, talking down. There's been, this is an opportunity for us to re-engage with young people, to change the way we learn together, to change the way we support together and how we then I think we need to scaffold more for, into the employment market. So I, we need to look how that education, employment, health come together in a real scaffold of way. So that we, we see it as an opportunity. And then I think the, the other issue is, I mean I, I mean, I just think that the economic impact is, and Northern Ireland has obviously, you've got the other added bonus of Brexit, right? And we have that in Scotland, but you've experienced some very different problems. As an outsider looking in, these are not speaking with a single message. My God, and I, from Northern Ireland, I know all about it, obviously, but it's just phenomenal. I mean, you need. I just think if I was a, if I was a citizen on the ground, I'm getting mixed messages from all your different parties. I'm going. That is just that is an ad, that will continue to impact adversely in their mental health. And I think there's a moral responsibility for the politicians to really step up the plate and show some leadership. So that's all. Very important points. We need clear, calm leadership that we can try, and, and that increases a sense of hope and trust that we yeah. 
through this. It's absolutely fundamental. And political instability, you know, and it, it, it's just adding to the sense that there's there's no hope that, you know, that there's nothing for our young people here. And I'm really, really worried about the proportions of young people right now who are planning to get away as soon as they can to get out yeah. of Northern Ireland. You know, that's concerning. Um, in terms of education, we want to get the schools back as soon as possible. What are the priorities there? What should happen whenever we do get kids back into schools? What would your recommendations be there, Rory? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is um, the my immediate response would be the Boris obviously has talked about the catch-up program, right, on education, and that's obviously important. But it's if you speak to young people, what young people, of course, that's a concern. But it's the social connectedness stuff they've all lost, and especially if you've got if you've got, and we all know that adolescence is such a challenging period. So I think there should be more focus on that end of things, right? as well as, of course, the educational end of things. The other one is been having, so every part, of, not just in Northern Ireland, across the UK, people in distress, you've got counsellors in schools. You look at the profile of people who go to see counsellors, mostly females. So once again, we'll have a service which is, at, which is ingraining ongoing inequality in services. So it's really good that there's counsellors and, and supports, but we need to think more innovatively that we can get access. To, we know men, three quarters men, are going to kill it, or people who die are men. We need to think really carefully how we really get a gendered response, a proper gendered response to men and people in distress. Of course, making sure women and girls get the support, of course, of course, of course. And I don't think, and, and then with other needs as well, like people with developmental needs, as well as obviously the social disadvantage element. I think it needs to be a proper planned response there will be my quick response without really thinking about it. Okay, no, that, that's fantastic. These are the things I'm recommending. And also just to highlight to everybody that the Department for Education do have an emotional well-being and mental health framework for schools that's going to be launched very, very soon that will tap into some of those things. But I think you've given us lots of food for thought and certainly um, I know you're working with the executive, Rory, and thanks for, for your involvement in our crisis response um, review, which is so, so important. So we're very grateful to you and grateful for your time today. So thank you, everybody. We're going to be putting this on YouTube and you know, if you have any questions or if there's any follow up, please get in touch with Rhonda or myself or contact my office if you have any comments, queries, suggestions for these webinars or things you want me to bring forward as mental health champion. Um, and we will leave it there. And sorry, we've gone a little bit over time, but it was certainly worth it to get to get all those. Can I just say one last thing, sorry, because sure, if, if you haven't read Sharon's amazing report, I know I came at the end of it, but um, it is fantastic and such an important piece of work. We will be on Twitter at the Suicide Prevention Research Network Northern Ireland on the MHC email address. And I believe you have a, a book or something coming out, Rory. Is that mm -hmm. we, we publicizing that when it when, when is the date? When, <laughs> when is it? 6th of May, Shimon, 6th of May. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So we'll maybe we'll get you back to talk about that at some stage. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Enjoy Thank the you, day. Do something nice now. That's been very heavy. And get in touch with us if you have any questions or queries. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.